TV viewers, it's Evelyn coming to you live from the camera store. And this is for a very special presentation tonight for six easy steps to capturing great wildlife images. And that's with Brad Hill of Natural Art Images. And this event is sponsored by Nikon Canada. Uh, there's also a bunch of work happening behind the scenes tonight to make this all happen. And hopefully everything goes off without a hitch. But of course, as you know, this is live. And so anything can happen. Uh, and that's thanks to the support and magic from the TCS TV live dream team. Tonight we have Drew, Jeff, Gary, and Riley from the camera store working with you tonight behind the scenes. Um, and of course we are live. And on that note, one of the best things about going live is being able to interact with all of you. So you can either join the chat and ask questions throughout the evening, or if you're not logged into YouTube and you have a question, you can also email me at evelyn at thecamerastore.com and I will be monitoring both feeds. Um, and on that note, if you registered for this event, we are going to be sending out an email with a link to Brad's gear list where you can shop some of the Nikon products that he has in his gear bag. Um, and we also have a special offer from our partners at Capture One. Uh, Brad uses their software and so we have Liz from Capture One who's going to be part of the chat Nate as well um, in the YouTube uh, chat room. And if you didn't register and you want to hear about some of the offers uh, from Capture One that we have special for tonight, uh, make sure that you email me, evelyn at thecamerastore.com, and I will add you to the list. But if you did register, we'll send that to you um, after the event. Um, lastly, before I introduce our guest of the evening, I want to once again thank Nikon Canada for sponsoring this, making this happen, um, and also to our local rep, Russell Vandelier, who's going to be in the chat. So if you have any gear-related questions, maybe you have some questions about this bad boy right here, the new Nikon Z9, um, he will be in the chat to, to help out with some of those questions. Um, but yeah, I'd like to bring Brad Hill on the camera. Um, if you are not already familiar familiar with our guest tonight. He's a full-time professional Canadian wildlife photographer who resides in the beautiful British Columbia. And I can't say British Columbia without calling it beautiful because he truly is in one of the most beautiful places of Canada, especially to capture wildlife. So welcome, Brad. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, Evelyn. How are you? I'm fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us to the camera store kind of in this virtual live type of way. Um, we've had a lot of fun chatting today just about, um, you know, getting ready for some of these virtual types of events and then also, you know, gearing up with some new stuff. And I think uh, you have some things on your, your wish list here. <laughs> Yeah, just a few things. Uh, as of uh, last Friday, uh, Thursday, I had to order just a few new things. Just, so, just a couple, yeah. just a couple. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Um, well, why don't you go ahead and get into it? I know everyone's very excited um, to see your presentation tonight. And again, be sure to put those questions in the chat and, um, and I'll be interrupting Brad with them uh, throughout his presentation. Hello everyone, uh, I'm really looking forward to spending a good hour, hour and a half with everyone tonight and um, I think it should be a lot of fun and what we're talking about, Evelyn's already mentioned it, is um, we're basically going to be moving forward with six easy steps to capturing great wildlife images and uh, let's get moving but the first thing I like to do whenever I'm presenting is put some context to what I'm, I'm about to say and my goal in wildlife photography is probably different than some people's. Um, I'm the last thing on the list that I am is a lister. I'm just not one of these people that has to grab every species of wildlife, but rather what I attempt to do, and I almost always fail, but what I attempt to do is capture nat uh, wildlife art or natural art. Uh, that's the company name, Natural Art Images. But um, you'll see that uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight will be reflected in this goal of mine of, of trying to capture natural art um, and not just you know bag different species so that's my approach to wildlife photography and the other thing I like to start off with is that one thing that I think everyone probably intuitively knows but uh, we don't often deal with it directly enough is the fact or sort of the unique nature of wildlife photography and
And that's to say that the only thing we can predict, and I'm stealing this from Michelle Val Valberg last week, but the only thing we can predict in wildlife photography is the unpredictable. And we really can't control much at all. So it puts a big onus on the photographer to really understand their system, um, their camera system, their uh, the setup or lack thereof, and really react quickly to things. And that's the challenge of wildlife photography is, is keeping everything straight in your head while still being able to react super quickly. And I'm going to have to say here that I'm going to give an, un uh, I have an unapolog unapologetic Nikon bias and simply because I've shot Nikon since the 80s or so. Um, so I've shot it for, for many, many decades now. And so everything you're going to be seeing will have a ref or will have a Nikon flavor. Um, I'm certainly familiar with other cameras, but by the same token, you'll be seeing a lot of Nikon uh, flavored uh, tonight. So let's move on. Okay, let's get with, without any further ado, let's talk about these six easy steps to capturing great wildlife images. And the very first thing is going to seem self-evident, but I think you'll find once we start digging into it, it's not quite so self-evident. The first step, honest to God, honest to God is know your equipment. Um, and on that note, Something that uh, I think confuses a lot of people is whenever we see a new camera release, such as the Z9 last, uh, last Thursday, um, which of the, you know, you have to wonder which of the uh, six zillion different camera specs are going to be the most important to any wildlife shooter. And if we wanted to pull up a quick list, I think most would agree that right off the bat that autofocus performance plays a role, some role anyways. And some might argue high ISO performance is important. Others may say, well, the camera's resolution, whether or not it has a crop factor, and if it has enough resolution so that you can crop your images. That might be something else some people are looking for. Others might say, well, with my style of photography, I'm really concerned about a maximum sustained frame rate, and I'm really concerned about burst depth. That is, how many images you can shoot without the camera slowing down. Others, and I'm often in this boat myself, um, will say that durability and reliability are the key features in a wildlife camera. And others, and again I'm in this camp to a certain degree, will say great ergonomics of the camera that really make you or help you make rapid changes to your camera settings are critically important. Now I think the most important point to hit right off the bat here is that Every wildlife photographer is different. So if you're rating each of these variables, these six variables I've listed in terms of what are most important to you, um, I think we'd find that virtually every wildlife photographer would stack them up differently. And historically what we've had to do is pick and choose different cameras depending upon what our needs are. So as an example, if you're looking for a fast camera in the Nikon line that's got great high ISO, high ISO performance, historically you always pick their flagship camera if it fit your budget. And um, at the same time, if you're shooting, you're into more shooting high, high res photos, something like a Nikon D850 or a Z7 or Z7 II would be what you'd be looking for. But interestingly, with the release of the Nikon Z9, we're looking at we may be able to attain arguably maybe not the extreme ISO performance you'd want, but everything else on this list is answered in one camera, which is really, really a cool thing. But most importantly, and this is some, where I'm coming from here, um, is I lead photo tours. Uh, I've been leading them since about 2005. And I've noticed over the years three areas that people really um, many times have to sort of enhance uh, their own understanding on or their, uh, to, to, to succeed in wildlife photography. And so these three most poorly understood camera features, believe it or not, tend to be the autofocus performance. And what I mean by that is many people can recite the specs of what their camera will do, but in the field be really confused about which of their many autofocus modes will serve their needs the best. 
So it's one of the things I really try to emphasize with wildlife photographers is, is to go out there and use the different modes and get comfortable with them. As an example, someone might uh, read that 3D matrix or 3D um, tracking is the best way to shoot birds in flight. I've always preferred using group area, so I'm a different sort of photographer in that respect. The second thing that people often uh, don't really have a good handle on is how high they can push their own camera in terms of its ISO performance and still be happy with the results. And that's the critical thing is that they've got to be happy. So you can't go online and read on dxomark.com or somewhere else what the camera is rated at. What you've got to do is go out there and shoot tons and tons of images and come back and say, okay, I'm happy with camera X at ISO 3200 or 6400 or 12,800. It's all going to vary tremendously between users, between cameras um, in, in a huge way. And the last thing, and this is particularly important for people who shoot handheld, is I often find a very poor understanding of what shutter speed people can hand hold their, their lenses particular lenses at in a field condition in a field situation and that is so critical in terms of uh, your shooting success in the field so those things alone I think are some of the most important things in terms of knowing your own equipment um, when you're going out to, to um, get a camera and then once you start using it in the field so anyways enough about the specific gear information let's move on a little bit now from there so now, the second step, I would argue, is, and the second word here is the critical one, is becoming instinctive with what most people think of as the basic compositional guidelines. And by that, I mean you don't even have to spend any of your valuable attention thinking about these. You want them to become, to be absolutely ingrained. Okay, so you shouldn't even have to think about these things. Now, Getting to this point, of course, can take years and years to develop. And if someone is behind their camera daily, like I often am, it's much easier if someone else shoots, goes out, shoots a weekend, then maybe away from their camera for a month or so and comes back and shoots again. It can take an awful long time to develop this skill. But it's really critical to get to that point because you don't want your brain thinking about, you know, the basic compositional skill, uh, basic compositional guidelines. And then of course you might say, oh, what's he talking about? What are these basic compositional guidelines? So let's have a look at just a few of them very, very briefly. And um, we'll go from there. So just be a second. Now a couple comments here. Um, I'm going to lose myself um, when we've got images up. There's no point in having my ugly mug there. So a few things though. All the images that are ca are show I'm going to be showing tonight were captured in raw format. And all of them, including ancient ones like this, and people who know the Nikon line will look and say, that was shot with a Nikon D2H. How old is this guy? But even this image was, um, was, was uh, processed with Capture One software back in 2005 or 2006 when I processed the image. So, but in any event, the first thing, most critical principle is something I just call simplify and isolate. And what I mean by this is, just the way our cameras work, they tend to record all the detail that's there even if we're looking through the viewfinder and only seeing the subject ourselves. So the concept is, is to simplify the composition and with any photography that's subject based, meaning you've got, it could be models, it could be wildlife, you want to whenever possible isolate your subject from the surroundings, especially the background. So it should become basically your go-to mantra out in the field. In the back of your mind, you should always be thinking, simplify and isolate. It's this, you know, it, and it's so important. Another shot here, same concept, simplify and isolate. Um, almost no, most photos that, or many photos that fail do so because there's too many complications in the image. And conversely, it's almost impossible to take an image that is, is too simple. You, very commonly, simple works and clean works. 
Now, I've got to make one editorial comment here. I know there's a lot of people going through this transition right now from uh, digital SLRs to mirrorless. And one thing that I found as a pleasant, pleasant surprise when I went over to the Nikon Z system was how some of my lenses, or basically all the ones I would use with a teleconverter, but how they perform with teleconverters. It's just dramatically better than in the DSLR age. Um, I, I'm not afraid or never was afraid to use teleconverters, but over the years after extensive testing, I found that they could be used only with very specific lenses to get really good quality results. As an example, a 300 millimeter f2.8 lens or a 400 millimeter f2.8 lens. Um, pretty exotic lenses, but you would get good results. But what I'm finding with the mirrorless is that they take to teleconverters so much better than the DSLRs did. And in this case, I am not referring to uh, I'm not referring to a mirrorless teleconverter, but rather this is the Nikkor 500 millimeter PF with the standard uh, F mount uh, teleconverter, the TC 20 or 1.14 uh, E3, and they work fantastically. So again, remember, simplify and isolate is the point we're making. The next thing that is probably one of the most basic rules of composition is the good old rule of thirds. And this rule is, has been around forever. And basically it states that if you divide your frame into three parts on the horizontal axis and three parts on the vertical, three, three uh, equal parts on the vertical axis, you tend to place your subject at one of the intersection points of the of the um, on those three three different axes or the two different axes. So basically, that's where you you, you know you place your subject and it works fantastically. So in the back of your mind, you should almost always be looking at off-center compositions. And if you go vertical uh, with one of your shots, rule of thirds can still, can still apply on a vertical capture. It was no accident that I placed this wolf's eyes um, right, in the, right where I did vis-a-vis -vis the uh, um, rule of thirds. And you'll see what I mean right now. So it's, it's something that it's just absolutely should be ingrained in your mind. Another thing that we always think of as a basic compositional rule is the use of leading lines. And here what I'm referring to is the intersection of not only the line of the ridge this Arctic Fox is on, but also that line of shadow that they nicely meet right about where the head of the animal is. And so it's a great use of leading lines. And in this case, I've also used diagonal lines, which tend to be from a compositional perspective stronger and also rule of thirds has come in. So you'll see this image more than a couple times during this during this presentation because it demonstrates a lot of different things. Here's a spirit bear, same thing, it's following a crack up a, up a um, up a uh, shoreline here on the in the Great Bear Rainforest and you know again rule of thirds is coming through um, we've got diagonal lines and we've got leading lines all happening at once. So these again are the things that you should be instinctively referring to uh, uh, using in a scene. And with leading lines, they can also be subtle and almost implied. And the line here really comes from that line along the forest leading right to the humpback whale which is in the middle of slapping its tail. So again, a little thing but something that you should be looking for in the field instinctively. Another app important uh thing to keep in mind is aspect ratio. So few people shoot, uh, almost everyone turns to ver uh, horizontal compositions by default without going vertical. And you've got to decide almost in an eye blink to go vertical or horizontal. In this case, it was the subject itself, the wolf, um, was the dominant axis. That is to say, it's, it dictated that I go vertical simply from those long legs and the, in a sense the verticality of the animal. In this particular case, it was the scene's dominant axis. That is to say, the waterfall and the cascade coming down that dictated that I, that I go vertical. Um, 
and uh, in, you know, it would have been I would have been fighting the scene, trying to to go horizontal in this in this situation. In this particular case, the spirit bear fishing, it was the subject's behavior that, in a sense, provided the dominant axis and um, and and dictated the aspect ratio. In other words, going vertical on this shot. Another thing that you should be almost ingrained in what you're doing or when you're making a composition in the field is factoring in directionality. And this sometimes is referred to as room to breathe or room to move, where the subject is either moving into the frame rather than out of the frame or looking into the frame. So again, another really, really common, uh, commonly understood uh, compositional guideline. Here with this uh, red-breasted nuthatch, you're, you know, all the negative space, it's looking into, and so it's not looking out of the frame, but rather looking into the frame. And same thing here with this grizzly bear uh, in a rainstorm. It's the subject is positioned slightly to the left of the frame to give it a little more room to look into. Its cub is trailing behind. And just one more example of the same slight directionality here of the bear and there's a strong leading line provided by that log. So again, the body's position of the frame. Another important point uh, is getting the point of view you capture the image from. In other words, how high the camera is relative to the subject. Probably the most commonly used uh, rule in wildlife photography is whenever possible getting level with your subjects eye level and for those of you who like to shoot with um, your LCD screen um, tilted um, it becomes even easier when you're shooting something low if you've got a tilting LCD screen and I think a lot of people are going to be really happy that the Z9 allows us to do that both in a horizontal format and in a vertical format so that's kind of a neat feature of the Z9 that that's coming. So just another example, um, oops, I went that, that one a bit quickly of, uh, again, getting low, low, low. Um, this one was kind of funny when I shot it because I was not in the water with the bear, but I was in a Zodiac and I was just leaning over. I had someone holding my leg so I wouldn't end up falling in the water, but leaning right over with a 600 millimeter lens to get this shot. And uh, it's when I think of what we had to go through before, I, all I can think of is, boy, I wish I had a tilting LCD when I was shooting this one. <laughs> I would have saved all my, uh, my fear of my equipment going down. Here's a little trick to put in your pocket. If you want, especially when you're shooting on water, but if you want to make it look that you, like you shot the image from even lower, add a little extra foreground to the sub and you're going to look like you were lower. I've had people swear that I had to be in the water when I shot this, this image and of course I wasn't. I was, uh, I was in, a, uh, in a very low boat but I was in a boat and uh, again it makes a big difference. I'll just show you what I mean here. Um, this is one way you could compose this image. It's a slight crop of the original, but it can also, if you'd added a little more foreground, you have almost the, the uh, feeling that you're lower down. So there's again the standard, standard way you may, you may decide to go with the composition. And then you've also got um, a little more foreground here. It helps with the reflection as well. So. Birds of prey or any bird times you're shooting uh, birds in flight, it, the big challenge there is trying to get up to eye level with them. And you then, tr excuse me, you're trying to avoid the, old, the, the issue of looking up at your subject, which against the sky is often a bad way to shoot uh, birds in flight. So it can be the big challenge. Now the other thing that you're going to face inevitably when you've got a whole group of guidelines in the back of your mind is that there's going to be scenarios when compositional guidelines conflict. So as an example here, we've got, we've got some bears, a uh, mother with three cubs swimming uh, in an estuary in the, in the Great Bear Rainforest with a strong leading line provided by the ripples actually and the reflections. And in this particular case, one might argue that we should position these bears a little lower in the frame along the rule of thirds. But at the time, I'm also debating when I'm shooting this, the power of the 
symmetry associated with the reflection. And so there's times when you've got to make a quick call in the field and decide which of your guidelines can be thrown out and why, but if you have them in the back of your mind, at least then you'll have debated the issue quickly and gone on to, to making a decision. So, And this is the first print that I ever completely sold out in terms of my limited edition runs on it, so I know I must have made the right decision on it. So. And just another one showing where symmetry, in fact, may drive your composition more than a uh, rule of thirds in, in an image like this one. So, But again, this is just step two in our six steps. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you've really got to be instinctive here with these. You don't want this stuff plugging up your brain when you're in the field. You've got far more interesting things to think about. And let's move on to those. This is one of my hobby horses that I get on is I really like to get people to actively think about the subject dominance in the frame. The question is how much of the frame should your subject occupy? And in this particular case, there's no right answer. But what I found helps me in the field is I've created for myself some arbitrary dominance categories. So I've got an animal scape and I'll tell you more about animal scapes in a moment, something I call an enviroscape and something I call an active portrait. And the point here though is, is these are completely artificial points on a spectrum where a subject could be tiny as in an animal scape or absolutely filling the frame as in an active portrait. But at least by keeping these in my mind, I'm always thinking in the forefront of my mind about how important subject dominance is and how I've got to mix it up. And the other suggestion I would definitely have for all wildlife photographers is rid yourself of thinking closer is always better. Um, that's something that is a huge issue um, with wildlife photography is that we'll, I'll see people that will be in front of a most, the most fantastic scene you've ever seen and they're not even shooting the shots and um, they're instead, Patty, um, they're, they're not shooting the shots and um, simply because they're waiting to get closer to the subject. Um, we actually have a good question on that note um, from James sure. saying um, that they're interested in photographing wild bears and looking at your images in relation to your gear, uh, he believes you're getting very close. How do you get that close without scaring the animal or becoming dinner? So maybe this is a good segue into to talking about your point on not getting too close. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now. Keep in mind that virtually all the images you're going to see or a, a large proportion of the images you're going to be seeing today are images where we're in the photo, we're leading, I'm in a photo tour and we have guides with us. Um, moreover, we're usually in a boat and the, the animals, uh, we're on, the animals in most cases are on shore and at the same time we're using long lenses and I would never advocate um, anyone um, going out to a bear. They they don't know, and I do mean that in that bears differ tremendously in their personality and they don't have experience with and getting, you know, moving in super tight with a wide angle lens to get a close shot. So you'll see it coming up very soon a lot of shots where we're much further back from them and you definitely want to go under very controlled conditions um, and put and never try to put, you know, put yourself or the bear in danger. And it's a huge point for sure. So. Okay, animal scapes. So what I mean with these is generally an image where the subject is quite small in the frame. I've had some where it's occupied less than 1% of the frame. And also the image, like a landscape image, conveys depth effectively. And a point I want to make here is that, and this in a sense pertains also to what, uh, or actually uh, the question that was just asked, it's a good reminder, is that people always think, um, oh, he must shoot those with wide angle lenses. Not at all. A lot of the animal scape shots are, are shot with longer telephoto lenses. Um, and you've just got to see the scene a little bit differently and subsample it. So, yeah. 
Um, so that's another, a, another quick question um, on that note is just about lens choices. Um, so this is from TJ, um, and they're asking, do you think that there's a prevalent dismissive or even snobbish attitude towards using zooms in the wildlife photographer community? Um, what do you see when you're doing photo tours and you're you're working with uh, wildlife enthusiasts? I, th I think that view was probably true um, a number of years ago. And I think it was, it was simply because um, for years and years you did have better quality optics on the prime lenses. However, in about the last five years, there's been some new lenses come out that have changed tremendously that game. And I've gone through, I was going to do a blog entry recently, and I hope to get to it soon, called Reverso World, where used to be all my short lenses were primes, and, or rather were zooms, and all my long lenses were primes. I'm now at the point where I'm shooting more and more with long zooms, and all my short stuff is shot with primes. And so it's, it's like we've gone a complete reversal. And I think you'll see with, uh, and I see you're holding up a 100 to 400 right there, um, yeah, the new the, one from Nikon one. that's coming out. Okay, here, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll I think we'll see that um, that that uh, bias is is going to disappear, and I'm seeing in the in the field and people that come on my photo tour so many more uh, Nikon two to five hundreds, or soon the one hundred to four hundred. I'm seeing one eighty to four hundreds, and I'm sure some will start be bringing even the uh, be bringing along the uh, one twenty to three hundred, which is a lens that I personally just love. So. Another animal scape shot. We'll just go, go on from there. And I'm assuming that uh, we're okay on that answer. Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, another animal scape. This one shot with a little bit long, a little bit shorter lens, but again, not a wide angle lens. But again, the critical issue here is conveying depth is what you want to do, and in any animal scape. And by the way, um, here's a good little thing to put in your pocket: is that if you want to sell prints or even just hang prints in your home, you're going to find um, that prints that are of animal scapes are going to have a much broader audience than a portrait of a bear as an example. A portrait of a bear will sell to a bear lover and almost no one else. And really in the wide market there's not that many bear lovers. However, a beautiful photo with a bear in it can sell to a much, much wider audience. Let me get my head out of the way here. Uh, this one here shot with a 300 millimeter f4 pf, the little tiny 300 millimeter lens. This one uh, again, it shot with a 70 to two, but I, I could have subsampled and brought in all you know a whole bunch of sh uh, animal scapes shot with um, five and 600 millimeter lenses uh, as well. So now the hardest thing about shooting landscape uh, animal scapes, and it isn't so it is finding them. They're tough things to find, but in terms of a great scene with an animal position correctly, they're tough to find. But what I find hurts people the most in the field is this, is actually seeing them. Again, because so many people have the closer is better attitude and with that you tend to, you know, you see a, this scene, you say, oh, let's get a close up of that guy. It's like, hold on, this is the scene of the day. This is a million dollar scene, you know, and then um, people want to just get close. So you've got to open up your mind uh, to seeing them and also remembering what scenes look like through your different lenses. So I've got good over the years at seeing a distant scene and uh, with my eyes and going, wow, that would be great with a 600. And it ends up being a beautiful animal scape shot and people go wow did you shoot that with an 85 millimeter and I'm like no so next up so that's animal scapes next up are what I call enviroscapes and what that really means is the animal in its environment and so you want to include key habitat features. Often the subjects are a little bit larger in the frame and now we've usually got some issues that we're dealing with with in and out of focus zones that we're trying to balance them out and uh, that's a really big part of making uh, enviroscapes work well. Whereas in animalscapes you're generally trying to make sure that everything is in focus 
in a in a in an a, a, um, enviroscape, you're char starting to deal with in and out of focus zones, and this is uh, people will find out is one of my big hobby horses is using out of focus uh, zones effectively. Just another example. Now this one, uh, this was fun. This is in the Kutsumatin Grizzly Sanctuary and obviously not a grizzly. But um, in this particular situation, um, we, it would be hard to anyone look at this and say, oh, there's a, there's a gray wolf in the middle of the prairies, right? It's a clearly a coastal scene and that's what you're trying to convey in a shot like this, is, is that it's a coastal scene. This is funny. Um, this is shot with a 500 millimeter lens and again people are often thinking when you're shooting with a 500 millimeter lens you always want to shoot them wide open or close to wide open to blur the background. In this particular case it was very apparent to me that given the proximity of that rock in front of the bear and the, for, and the background that if I tried to shoot wide open I would have had a. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to throw in the out of the zones behind the bear totally out of focus, and the, all I would do is make that rock in the foreground a little blurry and, uh, and ugly. So instead of stopping down, or rather instead of opening up to an f4 with the lens, I stopped it right down to f11 to capture the shot. It ends up looking almost like a, a muse museum diorama or a, uh, a diorama shot. So. And occasionally I will be in situations where I do use shorter lenses. This is uh, with a Nikon Z7, an 85 millimeter f1.8s uh, lens, which is a little short prime that I just love. Um, I've got a weird thing about 85 millimeter lenses, as some people know, so um, that's one of the examples of them being shot. Now active portraits, that's what we're talking about here. The reason I put the word active in my, with portraits here is that I think you've always got to, to uh, have an appealing and a striking image. You almost always have to have something different going on in the portraits because again, a, a, just a portrait of a bear looking at you in most cases won't thrill many people. But when you get something like a spirit bear here that has just submerged its head and come out, it has a different look to it. This was a great scene um, of stellar sea lions on the on the uh, northern tip of Vancouver Island where we do a lot of work. And it was funny because this I've got three images, I don't have time to show them all tonight, but in the first one the little pup was giving mum heck and beaking at her and she turned around and just gave it to him. And in the final shot she's just cuddled in. But again, an active portrait scenario. And there's a uh, little cub, again, shot with a longer lens. I am in the water shooting this, um, and the bear's on land, but um, I, it's having fun with its kind of bloody popsicle there, so. And there's a story behind this image, but I think I've got to watch the time, so maybe after when someone can ask me about the, 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 uh, the bear with the, uh, with the grass in its mouth giving me this stare. And another active portrait there. That one was shot, by the way, I'll go back to it quickly. This one was shot with that, um, the Nikkor 120 to 300 F2.8e. And again, another lens that does extremely well with teleconverters and even better on the Z mount cameras or the Z cameras than on the DSLRs. And one of my, an oldie of mine, but again, what I think of as an interesting portrait where you've got three polar bears. Mum's on the left as you're looking at it. You can see the head of one cub, and in the bottom right corner is another cub, all cuddled together. So. Now, the other thing, or another thing that I think you should be spending your time thinking about, besides thinking about how big your subject should be in the frame, is actively watching for either real sources or potential sources of something I call visual contrast. And I know I'm going to have to define this. Um, but uh, looking for sources of visual contrast. And that's, of course, the question is, what do I mean by visual contrast? Okay, here's a shot I, I, I nabbed just over a week ago um, on the uh, west coast of Vancouver Island with my Z6 II. And one form of contrast I'm referring to here when I'm lumping it all together, calling it visual contrast, is our classic light-dark contrast. 
Scenes with strong, strong contrast, light, dark, draw eyeballs. And it's a really good way to make your images stand out if you can get yourself into these situations. This was shot, I haven't darkened the background here in post-processing. This was shot at sunrise with just the light striking the gull and nothing uh, in the background being touched by light. Um, this shot's all about um, light, dark contrast as well. Here a side lid shot, again, dominated with a huge amount of negative dark space with a dark forest behind, with the bear, um, again, being side lit. Again, strong light dark contrast. Interesting a way to make a whale tail interesting because it's really easy to show, uh, to shoot boring shots of whale tails. Another form of visual contrast is focus or sharpness contrast. And so and here we're referring to using those lenses where you're able to, where you're able to um, really throw the background out of focus. And this is where the longer lenses, the longer fast lenses can be an asset. But the biggest thing you can do to have this work right is get, make sure that the background is further from the subject than you are to the subject yourself. So you've really got to watch your background placement. Another one, all optically produced. This is not computer, you know, uh, this is not post-processing related. Just had to do with how we, um, how the uh, foreground grass is. I shot this through grass and the distance to the background behind. Again, strong visual contrast in this image. That's all based on focus contrast. Another one shot with a long lens, a 600 millimeter lens, shooting a pied-billed grebe. And then you've also got motion contrast. This image doesn't show it quite as well as the next one, but where you've got a mix of blurry and uh, motion blurred and sharp elements in an image. So this one shows it even better with this um, shot of an eagle where you've got a mix of in and out of focus. Now I'm not talking much about the role of light and that's in a sense because I consider it subsumed by this whole concept of visual contrast. So what I find myself doing in the field now almost all the time is seeking out a strong form of contrast that I can either produce optically with my lenses in terms of a focus contrast or lighting like in this case side lighting or backlighting. So those are things I'm always looking for. And here's another side lit example of a bear. This is one that is really subject to interpretation and opinion. So I'm not going to say I'm right here by any stretch of the imagination. But one thing I would say is, especially when shooting with long, long telephoto lenses, is be really careful how you use your in-focus and out-of-focus zones. And I'll show, and we'll, and in particular, watch for objects in the foreground that are going to become unsightly blobs because they're out of focus. Um, and so you'll see that um, in some examples coming up that this can be hard to avoid. And the difficulty of controlling your foregrounds in terms of how in focus they are or how out of focus definitely grows as you go to longer and longer focal lengths of lenses. So if you're shooting an 800 millimeter lens it can be really, really hard to control what's going on in the foreground. Here's an example of, here's my classic bad example, and this is probably the only shot in here where I won't show you what it was shot with, um, <laughs> but my classic bad example. But what we've got here are distinct bands of focus, an out-of-focus foreground, an in-focus mid-ground, and an out-of-focus background that stretch all the way from one edge of the frame to the other edge of the frame. And in my mind, there's a big ugly factor when you're doing this in a lot of your photography, especially if there's you know, rocks and things in the foreground. In contrast, and I'll get myself out of the way here so you can see the image better, if you can make sure your entire leading foreground is in focus, it can work, it usually works much better. So again, something that rather than thinking about those basic compositional guidelines, I'm thinking about visual contrast, subject dominance, and how I'm using my out of focus zones in any shot. So here, both the foreground and the subject are sharp. 
This one's interesting in that we don't have a in focus foreground, but you really can't see an out of focus band in the shot. If you really look and count grasses, you might see a bit of one, but it can work in scenarios where you can't see a distinct focus line. And same with this next shot, which is a stellar sea lion just slicing up on the surface to grab some air and give me a look at the same time. So in this case, you've got the subject sharp, but there's no obvious focus band. So I guess my point is just really try to avoid those situations where you get clear focus, in focus and out of focus bands in the image. And it will often work nicely if you've got a homogeneous foreground and background, water being one example. Now, how do you avoid getting those focus bands? Well, the first thing people usually think of is they say, well, we just stop down, right? We're just gonna shoot at a smaller and smaller aperture so there, our depth of field is greater. Well, that's, uh, in this particular image, um, this was shot with an Nikon D700, and uh, I was using a 400 millimeter lens when I shot this. It was absolutely impossible with stopping down to have those, um, those killer whales in the foreground as well as the distant hill, hills in the background in focus, so in a single image. So instead what I did in this particular case is I saw the scene setting up and I, as it came, the, the orcas were coming by, I simply sh focused on them, shot them, held my camera steady, it was a handheld shot, refocused on the background and I made a focus stack. You know, so that's another neat way to produce those. Okay, we're moving on. Step six is striving, and I want to stress striving because this is really hard to do, but strive to capture the decisive moment. And wildlife photography is characterized by long, long, long periods of nothing happening, and then all heck breaks out. It just all of a sudden you've got 10 things happening at once and you've missed some of the most important uh, aspects of the of the uh, of the entire uh, or mo most important moments of the entire shoot. This example, I shot this one this last spring, again using that same 500 millimeter PF with a 1.4 teleconverter. I shot this image. Um, it turns out I, this is a female mountain bluebird that I found its nest. And so um, after the, the birds were deep into their nestling cycle where they were very unlikely to abandon their nest, I was able to sit back with a long lens and get some shots without disturbing them. And I noticed that I got this spectacular lighting for about a 10 minute window each morning and it took me a week going back every single morning before I finally got in that 10 minute window one of the birds on the perch it used before it went to the nest and it happened to go on hop on the perch and turn and give me the look um, and it was just fantastic so it was certainly the role of patience in this one it took me days and days and in this particular case after I found the nest I had to discover where the birds were in their breeding cycle because one thing you should always be extremely careful about is um, ha going in on a um, bird's nest and disturbing them and having them desert. And generally, as the birds have put more and more energy into raising their young, including spending time feeding their nestlings, you're usually the safest to get reasonably close late in the nestling cycle when they're feeding their nestlings. But even there, I always urge people to use extreme caution because the last thing you want to do is have them abandon the nest because you wanted a photo of them. But anyways, decisive moment, the role of patience. Let me tell you, patience is a huge thing. Uh, anticipation. There's a lot of times with, with um, animals, you can sort of predict what they're gonna do next if you know them fairly well. And, that, and so in this particular case, obviously um, as we approached, it actually this didn't jump in the water because of us, but rather there was a boat coming from another direction, but sitting back and waiting and knowing that something's about to happen. And a point I want to make here, and this is another one I shot just last week on the uh, up on the northern, or week before last, um, on the northern coast, is that often when you're 
when you're anticipating, if you're a lot of times what you'll have to do is sacrifice a lot of other shots and wait for that decisive moment. So you can't be distracted by, oh, this is a good shot of it just sitting on the rock. In this particular case, I wanted this shot just as the bald eagle took off. It's got a some other bird in its uh, talons there. It can't identify it from this shot. But basically, the point I'm making is that you commonly have to pass on so-so shots to get that more stunning shot and that's something that's uh, hard to get hard to train yourself to do until you've been out for years because you will in fact uh, want to shoot everything and we think we can because we have high-speed cameras but at the same time you'll often miss the decisive moment if you don't actually wait for it and you're shooting too early the other thing that comes up when you're in terms of uh, getting the decisive moment is the role of knowing your subject. In this case, this is shot in literally my front yard of my of where I live, and these deer were coming in regularly. And I noticed with this female, every time the young went to check out the milk, mum would always turn and sniff it. I don't know if it was trying to determine, is hey, is that my fawn or what? But it would always turn and uh, give. A little sniff and so I got this neat little circle and so in this particular case I knew the knew the animals and I knew how they behaved so I was able to get the shot this is another interesting one where what we had catching this is a Pacific white sided dolphin and I shot it with an, a lens that's got a pretty small angle of view a 400 millimeter f2.8 lens and the chances of getting this or a breaching whale just spontaneously by moving quick is close to zero. But in this particular case, um, we were on a super pod of about 300 of these dolphins and they were following our boat. And we started noticing this one dolphin that would keep keep jumping and keep jumping and keep jumping. So I just started focusing only on that dolphin and I ended up getting about 10 leaps in a row. Um, and again, it was a repeating pattern of action. And so when you get onto these things, um, just go for it. But again, you've got to know your subject and follow that particular subject and it can take quite a while to get there. Same thing. Um, re whoops, let's go back. Repeating pattern of action. Um, this was an interesting scenario. Um, again, uh, we got a humpback breaching here, and I got a great sequence of this. I didn't. Uh, I was going to show the whole sequence, but we'll just stick with the one shot for tonight. But it was a really uh, tough scenario. But we f we were out shooting whales, and we heard in the distance in this, and we couldn't see it because it was so foggy. We heard in the distance this repeated major splashes that we knew were a humpback breaching. So we finally decided to go over and look for this one that was literally a serial breacher. And we came upon it and we had been out for hours on the front of a boat and it was just pouring rain to the point where I couldn't even see through my viewfinder anymore. And so I did something kind of, uh, at the time I, I had to do something because I knew I was gonna be on a breaching whale. And they, they came down to, okay, how am I gonna get um, this shot and so what I ended up doing I had a 600 millimeter lens mounted on a tripod with a gimbal lens and so before we got there I put my hand down the, the lens and grabbed it by the end and looking along my finger I got to the point where I was using and just pointing the camera and using my my middle finger on the top of the lens as the pointer and so I started and sort of quickly calibrated myself so I could just swing the camera without looking through the viewfinder and fire off shots and hopefully they would be in focus and that's exactly how I got this one but again it was a repeating uh, a repeating pattern of action where this thing must have breached 30 times so it was just incredible and of course I couldn't I couldn't have a slideshow without a picture of poncho so there's a picture of poncho but again of course in terms of capturing the decisive moment there's also the role of high frame rates and this shot which I captured with a 50 millimeter 1.2 s uh, the new one from Nikon which I just love it's just a fantastic lens um, it, you've got to be shooting, firing off the quick frames. And when we see a new camera come out, um, like the Z9, that can do, you know, 
20 frames a second in full raw, 30 in uh, full size JPEG, or 120 frames per second in uh, 11 megapixel JPEG. It really opens up the opportunity to capture those decisive moments. And something else I'm going to point out here is if someone, um, this, I, I shot this image at f1.4, and I've had people ask me before, why didn't I open up the whole way? Well, at f1.4, I was already at 1/8000th of a second and I basically ran at ISO 64 and so I basically ran out of shutter speed and I couldn't use my widest apertures and this is one of the another one of the cool features we're seeing on the uh, Z9 is that it can shoot up to uh, 132 thousandth of a second and so here I could have easily gone to a completely wide open aperture to soften up that background even slightly more so again that really made it work so okay quick recap six easy steps to capturing great wildlife images first thing know your equipment i know it sounds trivial but you'd be surprised how many people uh, in the field including pros don't know their equipment well enough step two becoming instinctive with your basic compositional guidelines and i want to stress this is something that you want instinctive so it doesn't have to be top of mind you have more important things to be thinking about like thinking about your subject dominance in the frame like watching for real or potential sources of visual contrast like how you're using your in focus and out of focus zones these three steps take a lot of thought in the field so you don't want step two um, uh, in a sense um, plugging up your head your brain and of course striving to capture the decisive moment now in themselves each step is really easy sure you might have to go out and learn a little bit more about your camera but rapidly applying all of them at once certainly is tricky it's not quite so easy so in my last five minutes I only want to make one more, one more quick comment and this is a bit of a plea um, and where this is coming from is that I think most people who are wildlife photographers love wildlife. I don't think most of them are in it for the money. And uh, I'm going to ask everyone to please engage only in ethical wildlife photography practices. Um, you've got to always remember, and this is probably the most, I, at least in my mind, the most important thing I could say tonight is the welfare of your subject, the welfare of that wildlife should always come first. Um, and I, have for years, have been making this argument. I used to be the moderator, the lead moderator of the Wildlife Gallery on the Nature Photographers Network, and we had great debates about this subject, about ethics and wildlife photography. And at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to always placing the welfare of your subject above that of your photos and so be so careful about it and one thing I have done is I put together some very simple simple ethical guidelines and that's the URL and let me get my head out of the way so you can see it um, some simple ethical guidelines that you can follow that will help they're not specific they're they're generalized and so I'd really encourage people if in, to have a look at that and that would make my day if, if everyone was able to do that so and we've got three minutes to spare Evelyn <laughs> oh, yeah well we we have some questions so it might take us a little bit longer than three minutes to get through all of them but um, we hope oh, most of you can stick around um, so and, and keep the questions coming so uh, to start off with we have one from Kayla um, asking can you Tell us how you choose which camera and lens to take with you. Uh, she sees that you use multiple different cameras and lenses throughout, and of course, probably throughout your career. Um, but how do you decide on the day of all the gear you have, what you're going to bring? That's a, that's a great question. Um, generally, uh, in a sense, I've really come to the point where I've got two different sorts of kits. I've got what I call my commando kit, where if I'm going out and I don't know what I'm going to encounter, 
I can't take the big, heavy, fast prime lenses. So I'll carry something like a um, a perfect example would be a 70 to, 70 to 200 and something like a 100 to 400 and possibly a teleconverter. And so it's a very portable setup and I can take it almost anywhere I want to and hike with it for miles and miles. On the other hand, if I'm going on a photo tour or going to do a uh, specific shoot, I will have a goal in mind. So I'll be going out and say, okay, I want to get some portraits of big horn ranch and I want them you know top-notch portraits so I'll be taking something like a 400 millimeter 2.8 or a 120 to 300 but in those cases I'm almost always going to a specific location and I know how to get the gear there and it's not just walk around gear but it's always that's a daily battle every wildlife photographer faces is exactly what to bring and you can pretty much be assured that the most perfect photo will be taken with the camera and lens that you did not bring with you you know almost <laughs> all the time you can assume that but you know that's in a sense how I've approached it and um, I've become since we've gone to very high quality telephoto zooms if there's any question at all I almost always go to a, a telephoto zoom zoom and there's times too when you don't know how close you'll be to your subject so a great example is that we lead photo tours on marine mammals and if you're going to see sea lions on a rock you know where they are but humpback whales and killer whales and dolphins can be at any distance so the absolute best choice for those tends to be those wide focal range zooms so two to five hundred is a great example you know that's a very good lens optically from Nikon um, the uh, you know the 180 to 400 is priced in the stratosphere. Everyone knows that, but it's a fantastic lens as well. It's got a built-in teleconverter, so and I hope that answered have, it. We have a couple questions about teleconverters as well. Uh, one from James um, saying, "I appreciate your thoughts on teleconverters, and I notice you're often using a full-frame body with a 1.4 teleconverter. Uh, do you find a full-frame body with a 1.4 teleconverter as effective as using an APS-C body uh, with a one and a half?" Uh, crop factor? Well, yes. And the reason I say that is that it ultimately comes down to in that one, um, I shoot an awful lot in low light. And when I add a teleconverter, yes, I lose a stop. If I, if I, if I put on a 1.4x teleconverter, I lose one stop. But with most of the full frame cameras, I've got more than an extra drop of ISO performance to deal with on the camera compared to an AP, compared to a DX crop on a Nikon camera. And so with that, I, I still am a little further ahead vis-a-vis -vis the, um, vis -vis the amount of I, the ISO performance of the camera shooting full frame. So it's a tough call because there's situations where shooting with a crop camera can work better. My own experience, and I might get people jumping all over me for saying it, is that autofocus performance with long lenses especially at long distances, I have always found to be better on the DSLRs if you're using a full frame camera. I've always struggled and I've owned virtually every crop sensor camera Nikon has made. I've always had them struggle with the five and 600 millimeter lenses, especially if the subject is a long ways out. So again, back to full frame for that, so. Yes, and of course we'll have to see what your thoughts are on the 3D autofocus and the new tracking abilities with the Z9. <laughs> you know, you that, that in your head. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I've been, um, Chris, uh, Chris Hoganek, uh, that guy at, uh, at Nikon asked me a while ago about uh, what was my, this is about a year ago, what was my preferred autofocus mode? And I said, well, single point. And to be honest, it is with most cameras. Uh, the D6 and the D5, I like the nine point dynamic area an awful lot. But I've always been a toggler, a focus toggler. And again, just this last weekend, I was talking to Chris and, and he said, well, what about now? And I said, well, I think 
think I'm going to probably change to 3D tracking as my, defer, as my default the minute I've got my Z9. I think that's probably the route I'll go because not only will it track if the action, but I do an awful lot of focus and recomposing and that becomes a simple matter with 3D tracking. Um, is just nab your subject or have the camera nab it if you're even close to it and then just recompose and uh, I'm really looking forward to learning that so yeah so Fantastic. if you let me have that uh, Z9 this weekend <laughs> <laughs> come to Calgary <laughs> um, so Steve uh, has a, another question about lenses. Um, so sure. he must have some intel about what you used to use. So he said you used to use a Sigma 120 to 300 f2.8 lens and a 500 f4 lens, and you used to speak very highly of them. But now you notice that you're replacing both with Nikkor versions. What was it about the Nikkor lenses specifically that tipped the scales for you? Yeah, well, I have to look, I have to look at the lenses um, separately because there's different reasons. The 120 to 300 Sigma f2.8 sport version was a very good lens. Um, I always liked that lens and I still do and I still think it's it's good and it certainly comes in a lot lower price point than the Nikkor. And I owned that lens when I ordered the one. I It was a focal length I just love myself. I love a 120 to 300 and a, a 28 version of it. But I got, I made the mistake of ordering and doing a long test of the Sigma versus the Nikkor head to head and while in optimal Practically, the Sigma did quite well, not quite as good as the Nikkor. It was the autofocus in that case that made the big difference for me. And the change in my 500s came because Nikon came out with the 500 f5.6 pf which is about the size and weight of most 70 to 200s and it also is one of those rare lenses and i could list them on my hand the ones that i know that is as sharp shot wide open as it is stop down at all so the sigma 500 as well as the nikkor 500 millimeter f4e which i owned as well you had to stop those lenses down about two-thirds of a stop to get to maximum sharpness so almost to 5.6 and the 500 millimeter f5.6 was absolutely tack sharp and it was about a third the weight and a third of the uh, size and about well not so much compared to the Sigma but not far off a third of the cost that 500 PF is just in my view I hate to use this term because it's become hackneyed but it is a game changer that 500 PF is just an incredible lens and what makes it even better and I uh, you know today I was shooting just outside uh, and I'll just back up a bit um, don't look at that out-of-focus uh, camera behind me there. Um, but uh, this is the 500 PF with a one-fork teleconverter on a, this. In this case, it's on a Z6. And, you know, I'm not a huge guy. And I'm just, you know, this is just the easiest thing to use in the field. And on the Z bodies, you get tremendous performance with that teleconverter. So that is just, but that's a 700 millimeter setup that you can walk around with as though it's and, and get absolute stunning results um i could show a hundred shots shot with that thing uh, last week that'll just blow you away just amazing so Fantastic. um i have another sort of either or question for you this one's from jody foster and um, i'll let you touch on it but then also if chris and russ from nikon canada maybe they can kind of take it away in the chat a bit um but how does the nikon z7 II compare in low light performance for wildlife compared to the nikon d850 dslr camera Z7 II D850. In my testing, I, I actually tested, I didn't directly test those two cameras together in terms of low light, but I did test the D850 against the Z7. And I found them to be virtually identical in ISO performance. And then, uh, and I ended up selling my D850 shortly after I got my Z7. Then I purchased the Z7 II and I tested it against the Z7. And I, could f I found no difference in ISO performance. Therefore, I think it's quite reasonable to say that the D850 and the Z7 II are very close to identical in ISO performance. There's gotta be, I gotta say something else here. Um, 
that this issue of ISO performance is interesting because if you're shooting raw files, um, you don't really have this opportunity if you're a JPEG shooter, but if you're shooting raw files, you have the opportunity now to use in, well, I shouldn't say infinitely. I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's basically 1.7 stops better software um, noise reduction software than you had even two years ago. So all of a sudden, images that you used to be able to a camera say would be capped at 3,200 in your mind, all of a sudden you can shoot that thing at ISO, you know, uh, 8,000 basically, and get the same results with an, if you're shooting raw and you use the correct noise reduction software. So we're in a changing world right now with respect to ISO performance. And I, I've publicly said that my concern with the Z9 was ISO performance. Chris knows this and I've told this to Russ, etc. And I'm really moderating my view on that because I've found that with the new software reduction programs, I can push um, something like a Z7 II, which we're all assuming will have fairly similar ISO performance to the Z9 because it's identical resolution. And so I'm at the point where I'm going, I think it'll work for me totally fine, even in most, maybe not the most extreme situations, maybe not if I'm shooting ISO 25,600, but I don't do that very often. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. So I wouldn't worry at all. Uh, if you're going, considering going from a D850 to a Z7 II, you're in the same ballpark. ISO wise. Sorry if that was long winded, but I'm like Chris, actually. <laughs> you are. Like you're almost as bad as Chris. I don't know. You might be oh, totally. <laughs> we're, we're cut from the same cloth. It's a good thing he didn't come on camera tonight because we'd be here all night. Oh, long. we'd be going on all night. Yeah. Yes, so. Yeah. Um, so I just want to do a little plug here because you have another class coming up uh, before we get to some more of the questions. Um, and so it is coming up in not next Thursday, but the Thursday after the 18th. It's another free event. And this one is going to be sponsored by Capture One, uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, um, and it's getting the most out of your raw wildlife photos. So Brad's going to talk a lot about dealing with raw images, some of the benefits to it, and he'll actually show you how he uses Capture One to get the most of those images. We'll have another special offer from Capture One, the same one that all of you who've registered will receive tonight. Um, so if you want to check that out, uh, make sure that you register. You can do so under events at the camerastore.com or you can just subscribe and hit the notification bell and you'll get a little pop-up uh, when we go live uh, on the 18th. Um, so just quick little aside there. Um, yeah, a few more questions actually that we have that we can get back to. What safety tips do you have? We talked a little bit about ethics, but what safety tips do you have about dealing with um, with wildlife such as bears or other predators? And um, have you found that you've had to take risks in your work? And have there ever been any close calls? No close calls um, whatsoever. Uh, risks? No, you don't. If it's going to be a risky situation, you don't do it is what it comes down to. Um, and where I'm coming from there, I'm a biologist by training. And, and just so people know, um, I did study animal behavior for years and years. That's what my master's degree was in, was in animal behavior. Um, and we, when we're working with bears, not only are we always in the company of a guide who's monitoring everything, and I've worked with bears for decades myself, but you really have to be able to be with someone who knows how to read a bear's behavior. So if you're going in there without someone who knows how to do that, my advice is to stay either in your vehicle or at a very long distance um, and always, always, always carry, carry bear spray. And with respect to the bear spray, um, it's, some people will say, and as a matter of fact, one outfitter I used to work with, um, everyone used to carry shotguns. And I, we sat down and had a little chat about that. And, I, and 
Guns aren't nearly as effective uh, as a deterrent to bears as bear spray is. Uh, you're dealing with about a 63% um, sur uh, survival rate uh, in terms of, or I should say deterrence rate with a gun um, with a bear. And you're dealing with about 94% with bear spray. And so it's much better, but you just don't get in a situation where you you got the bear at all uneasy. And and I don't recommend anybody going in to, who hasn't been specifically trained in animal behavior going in and photographing um, any of the larger carnivores um, without a professional guide with them. That's what they're there for. That's what they're trained to do. And we have had, I've taken, I'd have to think about it, but I, it must be over 50 photo tours in to work on bears over the last uh, 15 years and we've never been close to having an incident um, you know we could have had an incident you incidents if we didn't know what we were doing but you just have to know what you're doing and you know to go on about you know we it would be a two-hour discussion to going on about what to watch bear, watch for and bear signals but it's just you know that goes beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight but um, go in with a professional only you know and uh, otherwise stay in your car that's all I, I'm, I'm good with that advice personally <laughs> um, but um, just to wrap things up this evening I have to ask what are you most excited about or what do you think is going to change the most in your photography workflow with shooting with the Nikon Z9 couple things. Number one, I already mentioned one, is that I think I'm going to be using autofocus differently. I'm going to be shifting over from from being a single point toggler, toggling my focus bracket all the time, over to using 3D tracking the vast majority of the time. And that would be number one. Number two is it's going to be the first flagship with a tilting screen and I'm not quite as young as I used to be and I love low angle shots so I won't be crawling on the ground quite as much anymore. I hope to be kneeling and using an LCD rather than crawling on the ground and those would be probably the biggest two um, that are going to be different for me but I'm just stoked about the camera being one camera that should do it all for me. You know everything from animal scapes at high resolution through to super high speed work and so you know I'm just really stoked about that Z9 and uh, I just want I just want mine. I just want mine. <laughs> shameless plug for the camera store tv is uh as you can tell we actually just got our hands on one it just arrived um so our review will be coming out very soon um so make sure you tune in for that and i can't uh thank you enough brad for sharing this very valuable information um, i think there are some great tips here and just putting it all together like you said it it sounds very easy when it's piece by piece but putting it all together just takes that practice and dedication that you've put into your work well, thanks for thanks to Nikon and thanks to you guys at the camera store for putting all the effort. I know how much work it is behind the scenes putting these things together. So thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to talking about post-processing in a couple weeks um, and that'll be fun too. So yeah. Fantastic. yeah. Well, uh, like Brad said, it was all thanks to Nikon Canada. So big shout out again to Russell Vandelier and Chris Okanuk from Nikon Canada, as well as Liz from Capture One for joining the chat tonight with all of us. Uh, we hope that you guys will subscribe to the Camera Store TV. Make sure you hit that like and the notification button so we can catch you again very soon.